This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Stop laughing at me. Why are you laughing at me? Because you're eating. Well, I can't control that, right? Hi everyone and welcome to the pod, you son of a bitch. Uh, welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. This is Bazzy's Backdoor Cinema, episode number eight. I am one of your hosts, Duncan McLeish. Welcome to the show. Up on this episode, we are taking a look at the two-part docu-series documentary that the BBC put out just recently. This is like very, very recently. Um, called The Ice Cream Wars. Uh, it's based on Scottish true crime. Joining me, and as of his suggestion, um, and with a whole story that involved, like, giving like the people the chance to create a poll on the facebook group page which just ran amok and asunder uh is is the is the star of this particular series he is of course the man he is of course the legend he is of course the myth he is the baz i love poor pokey hats with monkey blood big man yes that's right <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, that's a that's a very that's a that's a very Glaswegian entry. That's a very West Coast thing. That I'll explain <laughs> all that later on, folks. How are mm. we, Duncan? We've just finished recording a movie that made our hearts sing and grow three <laughs> sizes today. Um, and now we're now we're turning things to the the, the dark side of the the yeah. enjoyment spectrum. Um, the senseless murder of innocent people. <laughs> When you put it like that, you made me choke on my drink, you son of a bitch. Uh, yeah, we're doing we're doing the ice cream wars now. Let's we should get all the humour out the way at the start here, and then talk about something relatively sobering. Um, this like so we did the Bible John episode months ago. Now this is yeah. right at the kind of the start of Bazzi's Backdoor Cinema, which kind of spurred off the idea of I want we're going to do something less formal than Bazzi Horror. You want to come back and do more stuff on the podcast, which obviously makes me happy makes our listeners moist and in doing that you kind of threw a couple of ideas and you were like listen i know you like true crime i like true crime yep. how about we do the bible john documentary which i didn't know existed on the bbc we watched it loved it did our episode it went great and then me you've been toying in the background with various netflix series and all the rest yeah. that we could put our spin on um and we just not got our intake yet and to be honest we have been busy this year yep. that this kind of you went to facebook behind my back may i add you went to facebook and all i know is i log on i check my oh there's loads of notifications here what is this and you see you saw how difficult it is to corral the listeners on the oh, facebook honestly, group page because it ran the wild like fucking drunken cats <laughs> <laughs> what i had put up was basically all i wanted to know was did you enjoy the Bible John episode that we did. <laughs> because we're not the last podcast on the left, right? So oh, we are no, not going out to research a subject and give you our take on it. We reviewed a, a documentary show. So yeah. still in keeping with what we do, but it was true crime rather than fictional horror. So yeah. it was... Uh, and we could put, give it a bit of context because... Yeah, of course, of course. Like, yeah, you but, grew up in or around the area and mm. I grew up adjacent to the area. Obviously, yeah. with the time frame for the first one, but certainly within the time frame of this one. Mm. So, so <clears throat> all I was kind of wanting to know was, you know, did you enjoy that? Did, did we do that all right? Or would you rather just go and listen to the last podcast and live for stuff like that, you know? And would you like to hear... A bit more because I you know have an idea yeah. that you know what you, you know, forgot to do though. 
See, when you're creating a poll on Facebook, there's a little cog at the bottom that says options, and one of those ticks says, don't allow anyone else to put other suggestions in. Well, now, this is the thing, though. <laughs> I didn't fucking create a poll. In fact, I said at the bottom, this isn't a poll, because I'm not a prick. Just let me know. <laughs> yes, Baz. I enjoyed it. Uh, not really my thing, Baz. You know what I mean? Or, you know, get it would been better if you were topless, Baz. Or, you know, whatever you know what you say. However, and then all these fucking idiots, and I'm pointing at you, Chris Western, because you have to get your fucking dirty little bloody mink. Uh, they start creating their own poll <laughs> with answers. <laughs> like, what? Shut just the fuck there. up! They're Dude. just out there, Duncan, just creating polls. Honestly, willy nilly. <laughs> fucking world's gone mad. I yeah, anyway, I got so fucked up. Like, was like, right, do you want to yeah. date Duncan? Because if you do, I'll do it. I don't fucking care what they think anymore. All, all this stuff, all this stuff, it was just you, just like, like the mo- and then people just kept adding options, and uh, like, like, just stop kept getting- doing this. <laughs> So yeah, in the background, because uh, you didn't tell me what you wanted to do, you, like I no, knew we wanted to do something point, true no. crime related, and then you mentioned that this was it. Once again, I so I don't watch a lot of for listeners. Uh, I don't really what we don't have like like a Skybox or like anything like that in yeah. here now. So I have access to the iPlayer through the means that everyone else has the access to the iPlayer, but I don't watch that sort of TV. Like, I don't watch BBC, you know, watch any of that stuff. Terrestrial television, Duncan. The old terrestrial TV, Maz. So I'm very much out of the loop on everything that comes on, like, any of the original five channels. Um, and so as a result, I didn't know about the Bible John one. I did not know about this i don't know at yeah. all because this is very much up my alley of all oh, right bbc's done another scottish true crime doc i'm gonna go yeah. and check that i would have definitely had it on my so as soon as you mentioned it, i was like yeah we need to do this also we're saying off if, if anyone enjoyed the bible john conversation that we did off that documentary and you got a chance to check it out if you haven't it's still available go and fucking yeah, check yeah. it it's really fucking good off the back of that bbc have released the podcast which is still running just now where they're covering the case and interestingly enough today we were passing passing conversations on our our, our kind of the, the black metal bum boys is what we call our our chat with me you scott and liam and um the bbc had posted that they think they've actually uncovered evidence of police cover-up yeah as <clears throat> pertains to some of the things which is really really interesting because when we talk about this documentary here there is a um, there's a swath of the documentary that starts to lean into maybe the police kind yeah. of just massage certain things. Yeah, so... certainly on the Bible John thing, it's, it seems to be that since the BBC did that documentary, it has triggered a kind of a yeah. resurgence in interest in the topic because obviously the the alleged character of Bible John, <coughs> if he was indeed one person, um, was never identified. No, never caught. Yeah. Um, I have not. I've not checked out the the audio podcast myself. The yep. the article that was running on the BBC News website today was, was pointing to an allegation that they had a in the I think it was in the, the Helen Putter the first murder. Yeah, it's um, a, she yeah. was in a taxi, taxi with a, 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 this gentleman who was quoting bible verses to her and all that stuff yes. and this is where this bible john uh, persona kind of was born and apparently the police had some very real evidence that it may have been this particular person who happened to be the cousin of a high-ranking Gla- glasgow police yeah. officer and may have been ignored due to yeah. that fact they're, sh- they're stressing just now that the evidence have uncovered the police are saying they did not consider him a suspect but he was not pursued in any way because of his relation to yeah um but like they didn't i don't think the but i think what they're highlighting is if that's one level of the investigation it wasn't really dealt with how many others were 
were pushed aside for similar reasons. So well, I'm very much like yourself. I'm aware of it. I'm I'd like with true crime stuff and all the rest. I like to binge it at the end. Yeah. So I'll wait for them to finish it. I'll then go in and check it out. So like it, there seems to be a flurry. It's just is that thing where like the the public interest in, in true crime just now is at an all time high. Yeah. Um never really goes away, but it's at an all time high at the moment. So these things are starting to work their way through and the BBC have started to do because Netflix have kind of cornered the market on it at the moment. Netflix have done the it used to be HBO. HBO would have one a year, these incredible hard hitting like documentaries on like really horrific things that happened. The West and, Memphis three and that kind yeah. of stuff, yeah. Yeah, like and like the Cheshire Murders, they did that thing on the Slender Man not that long ago. The Grim Sleeper, I think, is also HBO. So they were really they, they covered those things really, really well. And then Netflix like were like, we could do that and we could do that every week. Yeah. And so Netflix has been doing it every week and some yeah, of them are fucking them, it, great. It was making a murderer was the one yeah. that that was making Netflix to be quite frank. Yeah, it, 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 it did kinda, that, yeah. <laughs> You know, like my wife watched that voraciously yep. with me, and my wife Corrine, was a true crime yep. fan. Corinne rattled it like, see, since watching, because we never we used to always think that I had like this really morbid sense of curiosity on things to do with serial killers when we first met, and then we watched Making a Murderer together, and now, whenever I want to watch any true crime doc, I'll, I'll, I'll run it by Corinne yeah. pretty quick. Do you want to watch this with me? 95% of the time she does. Like, most recently, we watched that Killer Sally. Uh, which is a fucking great oh, documentary. Yeah. Right, really, okay. really, really, really good. Really, really, really good. Um, and I'd like uh, once again, uh, my wife does like CrossFit and weightlifting and all the rest. Uh-huh. A great way for me to like point at that and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. "This is why you don't do the roids," because um, you will bug and so snap. Makes them bitches crazy. And makes yes, it also makes men's genitalia shrink. Yeah, um, makes theirs swell up like a wee cock. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, that's kind of cool. <laughs> the mass is down. I was like, say your shit. <laughs> Why did you do that when you said that? I want somebody with ten of them. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I do that a guy. bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, like <laughs> let's swing it back. Um, but yeah, so the so like we, we Netflix have kind of cornered it, but as a result of that, the BBC have kind of got into it as well. The BBC have always been really good at the like the panama panorama documentaries. Yeah, yeah. But this kind of thing they're doing now, is specifically focusing on like Scottish events, I think. Yeah. I think it's been, historical Scottish yeah. crime. Yeah, and th- this one. It's excellent. We're, go- we're going to talk about it. So it's probably worth giving a little bit of detail behind this one, and then before we get into actually talking about the the actual events themselves, like there's a bit, not a huge amount of of years between the two of us, but we grew up in two different parts of the country. Yeah. Um, I would have been three when the the arson events happened. You would have been a, a, a little yeah. bit older than that, but it'd be interesting to just tie up a bit of the kind of uh-huh. context for us. Um, this was um, this is produced obviously by the BBC. The synopsis is in 1984, six Glasgow family members died in an arson attack. Their murders were followed by one of Scotland's longest trials and a 20-year fight for justice that gripped the nation. Uh, it's a two-part uh, docuseries. It's available currently on... Um, on BBC, on the iPlayer. For the Americans, I I still think you get this. I don't think you get it maybe as quick as we do, but if it's not on whatever player that you guys have over at BBC World or whatever it is. BBC America, I think it is. Yeah. I I mean do a search for it. You will be able you will be able to find this somewhere and it is very much worth your time. I will say if you struggle with our accents then you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna struggle with this documentary. Um, however, persevere. They don't really give you subtitles in Scotland because they just assume you know what they're saying. Um, so yeah, that's probably be interesting to see if uh, BBC America has subtitles. Um, <laughs> there's at least one or two guys in this one where I was like, even I'm not sure um, <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, even I'm not like entirely sure. Uh, so yeah. Um, so like I say, I'm I like I just turned forty one this year. I was born in nineteen eighty one, yeah. so I would have been three when this happened. I don't, I didn't know any anything really out with. I knew it was, I knew 
there had been a house fire. I didn't know to the degree how many people had actually died. I remember this mostly because of some of the, the, the court stuff in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, the kind of exposure to it that came out of the wrongful conviction. Yeah, type stuff when, when I was there. kind of old enough to be like aware of what was in the newspapers and what would be on like uh, the BBC News and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I've always kind of had this knowledge of this Tam McGraw guy Uh in the background he would periodically appear in newspapers and on tv uh, through there as well and it would always be linked to the infamous ice cream wars without context Mm -hmm. um so that's maybe the extent that i can give any sort of detail a lot of this was like stuff i had never known about and the further it went into it the more i was kind of baffled oh to me like even the idea of the ice cream wars to me can contextually or conceptually that was people fighting for turf i'd never even considered that was dealing drugs like that's how naive i am like the ice cream van that came where i lived you got a, like an oyster it went with a with ice cream in it and that was it you didn't get maybe got a single cigarette i know some people weren't into that but <laughs> see we shop across from my school used to sell that yeah that, that's um, literally all i knew i didn't realize it was drugs and stolen so goods so th- th- this is what, what i found particularly interesting about this documentary so obviously I, i'm not quite 10 years older than you but kind of not kicking the shirt off it kind of thing i don't actually remember the events yeah of happening at the time but when i i moved up to glasgow in the early 90s so maybe about six or seven years after the, the actual yeah. murders and so on i moved up to go to college and during my first year at college i met and started going out with a girl who lived in the east end her cousin was in my class at college and i met yep girl through him kind of thing and when we used to go to her house she would drive along the ma and the particular turn off of the M8, which is the major motorway that cuts through Glasgow and heads up to Edinburgh, uh, the, the turn off you then took drove through Rakesi, which mm-hmm. is the particular area in Glasgow's East End that these murders were, were centred on. Um, she lived in an area called Car- well, High Carntine, as it was. So mm-hmm. at one point in this documentary, actually, you see a little kind of map. And Carntine is on it. She lived at the top end, which was closer to the Casey. So you yep. of, I, I used to drive through the Casey and then down to her house, kind of thing. So I, I kind of became a bit aware of it then. Mm. And as you see, her family, all were all East End people, kind of thing. And like I think I mentioned previously, I think we did the Bible John. I remember meeting Arthur Thompson, who was mm-hmm. Glasgow's. Al Capone, if you like, yeah, from yeah, yeah, her yeah. Term, in her grandparents' house and, and stuff like that. Um, not that her family were in any way connected with crime, but her grandfather had gone to school with the guy and it was her yeah. grandfather's birthday and it was just this old man in the house, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm getting introduced, you know, hello, recognising <laughs> the paper, soiled myself, obviously, and then I had to leave. <laughs> but because her family lived in East End, these names, you know, the folk would talk about, oh, Arthur Thompson, he's the gangster, and Paul Ferris was the other one. He was yeah, Paul Ferris. Is... Mm-hmm. He was the famous one. And then uh, Tam McGraw, that, that yeah. name used to come up as well. Um, so I, I had become kind of familiar about it. And then in the years following on that, the campaign to have the men can, that were being convicted of the murders yep. freed really started to ramp up and then that started to appear on the television and on the news and there was getting a lot of coverage and that's what you're talking about that's probably yeah. when you became aware that's when I became thing. aware of it yeah it would have been yeah, at yeah. that point you know um, yeah. the, the, the basic premise of the Glasgow Ice Cream Wars was that and, and interestingly this resonated with me as well so the, the like the Bible John documentary this the, this two part of documentary it does a great job of setting the scene it rolls right in very comfortably if yeah. you consider how the bible john episode 
contextualizes that time period in Glasgow and it gets to the point of people are living in these horrible tenement buildings and all the rest and then you jump into this one and as you're jumping into this one the tenements are being pulled down and people are being moved right. out so my wife's family <laughs> I laugh when I say this because her dad was a lawyer mm-hmm. <laughs> my wife grew up in Newton Mearns which is like the poshest part of Glasgow pretty much because yep. <laughs> her dad, her dad uh, had his own law firm you know and then they grew up in a very affluent part of Glasgow but her dad came from Easter House all right. Which was <laughs> again, it, it was further east than Rakesi, and these places are mentioned in this. And, and Easter House was the Badlands kind of thing, yeah. you know. He grew up out there, but the reason he grew up out there was his family came from Kenning Park, mm-hmm. which was a particular part of Glasgow close to Ibrox Stadium, uh, where uh, Rangers Football Club played. Never heard of them. No. And. <laughs> Our dad talks about, you know, they lived in the tenement flats and, you know, ha- the family, all, you know, the cousins, they lived across the street and another branch of the family lived on the same side but further up and all that, you know. And mm. uh, her, my wife's grandfather owned a shop, a corner shop thing in Kenning Park at the time. And when they built the M8 motorway that we talked about, when they actually built that through the centre of Glasgow, mm-hmm. They demolished entire areas of the city. Entire streets were just torn down and never rebuilt. You know, the, the motorway went where they were. And the, the particular street that they lived in in Kenning Park was, was part of that. So they were relocated and they were relocated out to Easter House. Mm-hmm. And Easter House was one of these new housing schemes that grew up on the kind of outskirts of the original city of yeah. Glasgow. And you had places like uh, out in the west, you had Drum Chapel and mm-hmm. stuff like that, uh, leading out towards Clyde Bank. Up in the north, you had uh, Springburn and beyond that. Yeah. And towards the east, you had places like Bacchese, Calm Time, and, and Easter House. So I remember my father in law talking to me about this, you know. So the, obviously, their house was kind of bought out from them, it was a compulsory purchase. Yeah. But, so they lost their house and the business as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they were moved out to Easter House. And they talk about this in the documentary. All these families moved out there. And there was loads of housing and good housing mm-hmm. compared to what they had been living in in the more kind of inner city. But there was, there was no amenities. And well, yeah, this is like planning, planning, like to, like planning laws now. If you're building a housing yeah, estate, you worked in this area at one yeah, yeah, pl- yeah, planning laws now. If you, if you, if you're building like a sizable amount of properties, there that is built in. There needs to be amenities for the kids. So there needs to be play parks built yeah. in there as part of that. There needs to be some sort of like shop, so, some sort of grocery area or yeah. whatever. And then when it reaches a certain size, there needs to be a new school. Like yes, you physically have to build a school. And, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, you yeah, have, exactly. you have, and it's all tied in now. Nothing will be approved if those things aren't met. So it blew my mind. God, you just assume that these things are. Oh, it's always been that way. It blew my mind to see in this documentary these huge areas of housing and all that. Well, there wasn't any shops. And I'm like, yeah. and because so, this is before supermarkets. Yeah, you know I mean, this none. is. Yeah, this is before like like 24 hour Tesco's and all the yeah. rest you know what I mean so the like, thing people that's got survive? to be remembered as well is that at that time even if people could drive the vast majority of people did not have cars yeah. so yeah, it's yeah. not like you know I remember when I lived in Glasgow I didn't really live anywhere near a supermarket but I could jump in the car and I could be at one in five minutes yeah 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 it wasn't like that then so my wife's grandfather he started up one of the mobile vans. Oh, it, right. it wasn't actually an ice cream van, but it, it was a mobile shop. They called them in those days. And it was basically, he would drive around with, you know, pallets of loaves of bread and milk yeah. and different things, you know. And and he actually built, so he kind of rebuilt his business doing that. That way, yeah. And then once it was up and running and they were bringing money in again, kind of thing, I, I I, really, I wanted to speak to my father-in-law before we did the show, but I've not had the chance because mm-hmm. I, I think they eventually built another wee shop or something. Mm-hmm. But anyway, 
that all kind of resonated with me, but in the documentary they talk about the ice cream vans. So they would yep. drive about the schemes because all the kids wanted an ice cream cone and that. But they weren't really just ice cream vans in the way that maybe <laughs> you and I grew up with them. Because they sold yeah. everything. You know, yeah. they, you buy toilet rolls and all that, anything like that. Because, and they were catering to this need that these displaced communities had kind of thing. And in the documentaries that it's the company, the, the, the main company featured is Marchetti Brothers, who I, I wasn't it. aware of. Mm-hmm. But they were, uh, they'd obviously seen this kind of gap in the market and they had a fleet of vans which they then kind of sublet, if you like, to subcontractors. Yeah. They would take the van out and sell their wares and so on and everybody get a cut. And it was all perfectly legal and above mm-hmm. board and, you know, everybody made a good living at it kind of thing. And there's a, a fascinating character in the documentary who... Um, he features very heavily in the first particular episode mm. he was the company secretary of Marchetti Brothers. Yeah. And he has very ill-fitting dentures. Yes. <laughs> I was sitting, I watched the thing because my wife wanted to watch it. So it was like and I were watching it together and after about his second appearance on screen, I was like, are his teeth flapping about in his mouth? <laughs> it's like, aye. And it was that thing, once you've seen it, you could You can't unsee it, unsee that's it. it. Why did nobody, like his daughter or somebody, go like, Dad, see if you're going in the telly. You'll need to get a fucking teeth sorted so he would talk. And yeah. after about every five or six words, his entire top set of teeth would <laughs> drop down about an inch in his mouth. And obviously the inflection of his words would just change yeah. very slightly. Until just he used his tongue to push them to push back, back up. Up. <laughs> <laughs> And I have... <laughs> I, I, you, you must know them as well. I have met many an old man who's like that. In fact, one of the guys I go to the Masons meet, and he's a lovely big, I love him to bits. Mm. Big Jack Nixon, Jacks. To this day, he's the same. He's talking to me. He puts them back in with his bottom teeth, though. So he's, gonna, he's forever clacking his teeth together. But like, my grandfather had false fucking teeth, and I never remember that happening. So it's not impossible to fix. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so, but yeah, but basically the, the story was, the, the story of the Ice Cream Wars was that um, there was these guys all subcontracting these Marchetti Brothers vans going round all the various estates in the East End, making a great living. And there's yeah. a very telling uh, statement by this guy who's the second of the company. He said... You know, if you were going round selling ice cream and all the bits and bobs, you could make a good living. Yeah. But if you were willing to sell stolen goods, yeah, you could make an amazing living kind of thing. Yeah. Now, my original... Sorry, just to finish. Yeah. Basically, gangsters then saw the, the, op- the, the kind of potential to make money in these vans. And they started kind of trying to muscle in on these routes. Because at the end of the day, if you drive your van in a scheme and you get to everybody first, everybody spends their money in your van. And if there's another van coming five minutes later, they're going to make half of what you did. Yeah. Because you've already got the people that really want to spend their money because they're out in the street waiting for the van to turn up. Yeah. And you've already hoovered all that up kind of thing. It's, it's the, the equivalent, it really is, because like, watching it, they mention something about, like, um, like, linking it to, like, certain phrases being very similar to the Mafia, and all that went through my head is, it is the kind of, it's the waste collection management business in, in America, but over here, instead of it being, like, rubbish rubbish collection, it's, you know, it's ice cream vans. Ice cream vans. And this, it's the and this same is what's kind of so crazy about it because you think ice cream vans and you, you think of that fucking pervert in the Phantasm movies. Yeah, you know what oh, I mean? Let's not go back <laughs> there. <laughs> but you think of the jolly, like, ding, yeah, ding, 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 I mean? ding, like happy music you know I mean? and kids Cones running out. And the ice cream cone, like they mentioned it as well, like, like ice cream back then. We're talking ice cream back then, so we're talking about plain ice cream yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're not yeah. talking about like the 75 flavours that you can get at any like we're talking about plain and they were basically saying like it was very inexpensive to make and the markup on it was ridiculous yeah like so you, this is this coming back to this, if all you were selling was ice cream that, you could um, you could make a living from it 
that thing I said at the start, four pokey hats is two <laughs> ice cream cones. Yep. The, the term pokey hat, I only found this out a few years ago. It actually comes from an Italian term. And this Wouldn't goes back me. to it was the Italians that introduced ice cream That's uh, right, yeah. in Scotland. And there was quite a lot of Italians came here in post war and pre war. Yeah. And they, they used to sell them from bicycles. They had a kind of refrigerated unit on the front of a bicycle and they would mm-hmm. cycle up and down the kind of seaside resorts like Darun, where I'm from, and Lards and these places. And they would sell them. And it, it, it's a word, I can't, or it's two words or something like a. Pochiati or something like that, right? right? Mm -hmm. And it became corrupted with the Scottish language. (laughs) It doesn't surprise me. Yeah, if you've heard me try to pronounce any name that isn't McDonald, (laughs) then you'll see how easy that's done. Uh, That's where Pokey Hat comes from. So basically, Ah. it's a nice cream cone. But Monkey Blood is, and I never used this. This must have been a Glasgow thing, I think. They used to have a, a red kind of rasp. Vaguely raspberry flavour. We call yeah, it yeah, raspberry, raspberry, red raspberry sauce that well, didn't yeah, taste sauce like raspberry. That they put over the top. Sugar of water, essentially. Yeah. It's sugar yeah. syrup, but it's coloured red. But for some reason, people in Glasgow called it monkey blood, and I do do not know where that came from, but they did. Well, so blood, that's honestly, it's like was. a different one. As you say, <laughs> it it was there was only vanilla ice cream in those days. Yep. So monkey blood, that added a new, <laughs> like you, a, a new. <laughs> yep. Uh, what's the word I'm fucking looking for here? Spin. New dimension yep. to the vanilla yeah. ice cream. As there's a yep. chocolate flake, you can get Oh, that we flake at the top, we 99. Nine. So, yeah, um, yeah, so that, that's ice cream. Anyway. But that's, yeah, so that's the, the basically essential what you have here at the, the kind of the core of this to the equivalent idea of America is essentially a tough war over routing yeah. rights. So the, the criminal element saw the opportunity to make money and yes. they started muscling in and because this, yeah. this is how so you get This is how you get introduced our main characters here. Yeah. And then the criminal element in Glasgow, of which there was a, a large criminal element, particularly mm-hmm. in the East End in those days, um, started muscling in and trying to force these guys out because yeah. they knew they could make the money and you know if I'm out selling ice cream at the back of a van and somebody's sticking a gun in my face, I'm probably going to think about a change in career. I am. I'm, I'm thinking ice cream might not be worth it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like the the documentary follows the uh, the kind of culmination of this this kind of muscling in on an event that ultimately involves arson and the death of a family, um, and then the conviction of. Originally, like four people are brought to trial, only two are convicted, though. No, six came six, to trial. Six, sorry, six went to trial. Two went down for the murders, and the other committed. ones went for other Basically, things. Basically, yeah. a, a flat was burnt out in one yes. of the tenements, but there was a large family living in it, and it, yeah. two people died there at the scene, but another four died in the days after that. Yeah, um, from yeah. various. Right. Almost, almost like I'd like a like a full household gone. Yeah, um, and from I event. think the youngest was two, and there was literally a baby. Yeah, died in it. Um, it, it, it was absolutely heartbreaking. It's horrific. This house yeah. had been targeted. This particular guy, Andrew Doyle, was yes. one of the ice cream van drivers. And, he'd, and he'd there'd been a ramp up with down. him. Yeah, yeah. He there'd been, been a ramp targeted. up. Yeah. Uh, so this was like, like a, there's a clear. A clear thing of escalation of him being yeah. warned, his windows being smashed, his shotgun being fired at his yeah, vehicle, and then, you and know, then the, the arson event they, that they happens after. Petrol through his yep. the letter box of the yep. flat and dropped a lighter in after it and burnt the flat. Was out. was was interesting is the, the two guys that go down are criminals essentially, right? You know, they they come from criminal backgrounds, which I think is why the police focus so heavy on them yeah. but it's that idea of like as it goes on and we'll talk about it a little bit more when you start to like look at the evidence here it is wholly circumstantial the the main guy the main guy thomas campbell campbell yeah so tc basically there, there are the two men that get in for it, there's thomas yeah. tc campbell yeah and joe steel mm. these men get convicted of this go to jail and serve the 
best party about 15 20 years, years, I think. Yeah, it's so 15, years, 20 right? years, yeah. But they maintained their innocence the entire time. Various events happen, and eventually they, they do get released under... Um, Purely because of change in the law yes. in Scotland. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. And that's what the ice cream wars became yeah. famous for was actually these men fighting for their uh, freedom and to get yes. their uh, convictions overturned. Yeah. Now, so this is what interested me, right? Because prior to watching this, yeah, my the picture in my head of the ice cream wars was that it was two opposing crime families. Yep. This is me. Oh, yeah, right, because well, like, you're in the same fighting. boat as me. Yep. Because basically all these ice cream vans were selling heroin. Right, see, I thought they right. were... T- <laughs> this is the naivety of Duncan. And I didn't think they were selling drugs. they war and it had culminated in this... These people getting burnt out. Yep. And that these two innocent men had been fingered for the whole thing. Yeah. After having watched this, what I found out was that it wasn't. It was one criminal element trying to muscle in on a perfectly legitimate business that was being yeah. run. Yeah. And but more particularly, um, Andrew Doyle, who was the driver whose family were targeted, was just a nice, hard-working wee guy. It, uh, and, 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 like, and innocent. Was, yeah. You know, they were maybe a bit poor. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have an awful lot of money, and he was the main breadwinner. That's why he wasn't willing to give it up. But none of them were involved in criminal activity at all. No. Yeah. But the other thing was, and it was, uh, the, I think it was the secretary of Marchetti Brothers, he had said, he said, we search those vans all the time. It's, you know, you would find stolen stuff sometimes getting plugged in that. He's like, we never once found drugs. Well, there's a police officer. There's yeah, a police officer that says the same thing. The police uh, officer, like, basically that. I don't know where this rumour started from. I don't know how it's kept going, but if there was drugs in any of those vans, we never found never it. Never saw it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, never I, saw it. And I, it was I, like, we were stopping them. Like, we were targeting them specifically uh, for, like, stone goods and all the rest, and we never found heroin. Never found heroin. And now, I grew up with this assumption that every ice cream van in Glasgow came <laughs> up and asked for a fucking 99, and you got a bag of smack handed to you. Do you know what I mean? I really, really <laughs> did. I thought that's what it yeah. was all about. Yeah. And that was why they were all killing each other over it. But it's, it, weird it to, it's weird how those things go out. And we were talking about this recently, actually, that like we on the Bible John episode, we were talking about the World's End murders. Yes. And we were like that, you know, that, like great unsolved crimes and that Tobin guy with the, the World's yeah. End murders. And then in the interim... I was listening to another true crime podcast and they covered the World's End murders. And I remember hitting play and it got that. Well, this is going to be pretty boring because all the other ones, like, they give you the killer at the end. Yeah. And then they're like, you know, and the, the case was solved in 2016. And I was like, no, no, it wasn't. Like that. Ah, that's not right. This has made a mistake here. Listen to it all. Went online. Case was totally solved. Yeah. Like, they've got, they've got, they've got evidence. The guy's convicted and they've got evidence. And yet, me being attuned to all these things in the country and all the rest, probably because I don't watch the BBC anymore, did not fucking know that detail at all. And that to me is a big fucking deal. Yeah. So it's interesting how these stories go out in particular ways. You almost like hearsay, you hear certain things or things are reported certain ways in the newspapers that you just latch on to, and that's your narrative. Yeah. Moving 100%. forward for well, those things. Like living in Glasgow and that through the 90s, as I did, um, first as a student and then buying my first house up there and working in the city centre and all that, I remember, you know, the ice cream wars, the, the killer, the alleged killers, the guys yep. that had gone to jail for it being, they were in the news all the time. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, everybody was like, you know, these guys are in there and, and having seen now what they were doing, yeah. You can understand why everybody knew that they were kind of innocent, you know? And we'll come on to that in a minute. But what wasn't put out there was the fact that, for instance, Thomas Campbell, of the two of them, yeah, Thomas Campbell was a vicious gangster. He was. Well, this is the thing. This, like, cause, There's like, no getting by it. He was, he was a... The, 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 the setup to that, the introduction of him at the beginning is like that. 
was, you know, like very much into violence, very much into using Stabbed weapons. Stabbed and of... slashed his way through the East End, I believe was the term that was that's used. That's it, like, so that's the, the, like, so if you're the police, and I, like I say, I hate, I hate this because there's that kind of thing. If you're the police and you're putting this together, he probably is the prime suspect. Yeah. Right? You probably want him off the street. There's a right way to do that, and yeah. there's a lazy way to do that. Yeah. And what comes through this documentary is slipped into that really lazy way of doing things. Yeah. And of all the things to get him, get him on all the other stuff. Yeah. But this is the thing, like th- through the course of the the campaign for the releasing that, they they were held up like these. Yeah. Like you and I. <laughs> getting fitted up for gangland murders or something like that. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, well, the other guy, horror podcast or yeah, like, The other guy, the other guy, <laughs> the other Steve. guys, yeah. yeah, like his introduction is like, my, my dad was a safe breaker for the craze. Yeah. Well, and I'm like... <laughs> this is the thing, in fairness to Joe Steele, Joe Steele, if he was involved in criminality, he was much more low level. Uh, but I, like, from the sound of things, it's very you know, low level. But he does, he, he says, you know, he says, my dad was like a bad guy. He's yeah. a safe blower, you know. Yes, uh, and he, he didn't say what for the craze, but he knew the craze, you know. He'd, yeah, well, so like the, the BBC took the, the BBC took artistic license yeah. by putting up a photo of Roddy and Reggie, and I was like, "What we're doing?" But there's a there's an <laughs> absolutely brilliant bit in this, uh, where Joe Steele's mum, who who had imagines probably passed away now, but yeah, there's a bit where the, yes. The yeah. case first starts to get... So they're being jailed. Yeah. And then the, the, the case for the release starts to build. And the, the BBC, I think it is, go to interview her, uh, his yeah. mum. And she had she stood up and testified in the court. He couldn't have done it. He was yeah. in the house with me. Yes. I was up till three in the morning that night. He never left this house. And the jury obviously chose not to believe that woman right now. She's just a wee... Glasgow housewife woman. Yep. And this is the bit I love. This to me sums it's great. up the class the Glasgow housewife of days gone by. Just like that. Cause I never liked it. I stood up and I told them my Joe never did that. Yeah. And I don't lie in court. Even when that husband of mine <laughs> I never stood up in court for that. <laughs> she basically <laughs> said my husband was a scumbag criminal. And I'm, I'm damn sure I never stood up there and defended him, but I'll stand up and defend my boy because he never yeah. done it because he's yeah. way me. And I just thought, that's absolutely brilliant because yeah. you've got the decency just to admit my husband was a scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but I wouldn't he stand up in court and defend him. So he's a, he's a, he's a kind of, he's a, like, he's a compelling character throughout both we get more yeah. of him in the second part yeah when, because like, he's still like, alive so he actually yeah, appears like, so, so TC's passed away but TC was the one that became like initially even when when they're released you see he does the he does the press statement he does yeah. all the talking um well still doesn't he you know he kind of because I think that's the thing that's worth mentioning even when we kind of because we're jumping a bit about but in a, a good way because we're enjoying the conversation but Ultimately, what we come off of the back of this is these two guys are set free. Granted, one of them definitely like a very strong criminal. Yeah. Um, the other one being maybe less or so. But there, there really isn't like this is one of these documentaries where right, they're freed. Is the Glasgow two are freed at the yeah. end of this one? But there is no winners here. No, like that's like fifteen to twenty years of their life gone, and the family never get justice yeah. because the the case is for all intents and purposes closed and, and joe Steele says that himself yeah in the documentary yeah. he's like the doyle family never got justice over this um you know and he said he still feels bad for that family you know yeah. there's six members of the family wiped too yeah two guys sent to jail for it but it wasn't them so the people that killed their family are still out there or yeah. they may have passed away, but were never brought to justice for it. Kind of yeah, the, the prevailing theory is put forward by them is that yes. it's Tam McGraw that Tam did McGraw, it. McGraw, who is now dead. Who is now um, dead. What's interesting is I think the guy from the ice cream firm thought TC did it. 
Well, that was, the that was the bit that kind of floored me right yeah. at the very end. Uh, the the fellow who was the secretary of Marchetti Brothers, the company who ran the original vans, yeah. they, they kind of circle back to him at the end of it as if they say, so, if it wasn't them, yeah. who do you think you did it? And he said, you know, obviously, so he was involved in that case from the minute it happened. Yeah. Like he was phoned during the night when that flat burnt down and everything. Mm-hmm. And he was up in court testifying about things that happened to the bands and all this. And he said, Thomas Campbell maybe didn't strike the match. Yeah. But he, he or in his uh, belief, Thomas Campbell was behind it all. Yeah, he ordered that. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is and, which is quite interesting because he's the only dissenting voice, really. Yeah, but he's the one. You've got to figure out them all. He's probably got the most knowledge of it all because yeah. I, I'd imagine there was quite a lot of stuff that happened to that firm and their vans mm-hmm. that wasn't included in the documentary. You know, I'm, I'm quite. Yeah. There's kind of a couple of incidents talk about a van getting shot at, you know, yes. and one getting overtaken or something. So it makes it sound like two or three things happen. It, it was months, if not years long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they do. They, they kind of yada yada through quite a bit at yeah. the beginning to to build in. They yeah. do jump like months in the timeline to get to the the, the arson. O- on top of that, as well, it's worth noting that like TC and um, and McGraw were, were friendly. Oh, McGraw and Cam- yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. About McGraw. Like we're friendly. So like there is that. Like there could be a scenario where. Once again, without, no, this is like not even speculating or whatever. It's just me like talking at my ass. But there could be a situation where someone does order it or makes mention that it wouldn't be good if something happened, yeah. and then McGraw goes into business for himself. But based off getting the, almost a kind of unofficial nod, yeah, um, from 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 that direction as well, because they do talk about TC wasn't he got to a certain stage where he didn't want to get his hands dirty in terms of the stealing of goods yeah but he was more than happy, happy to sell, to sell them, them on. Yeah, yeah yeah more than happy to sell them on the a, roots there's a great bit as well with joe Steele. so as i say joe Steele of the two of them that went down for it is the one that's still alive so he yeah is interviewed for this documentary and he talks about it and he admits very freely at one point he's like i was brought up you don't talk to the boss yes you know so which is, because there's a really there's a really interesting it's, it's the fucking hypocrisy man that like drives me wild you've got a policeman then saying like that ah, there's a, a code it's a ridiculous code where they don't snitch and I was like the police have the same code yeah like police officers do not tell another police officers mm-hmm. like at all so what what's different there it's exactly it's exactly the same thing so like, to come back to the kind of facts of the case so the the, the, the reason that they got the guys was these signed confession or not signed confessions but verbal confessions that they overheard verbal given. confessions yeah now during the the fight to get them released the original lawyers had focused on testimony that had come from a guy William Love who was in jail at the time yeah and was well known for been able to come up with information that might get a few months knocked off his sentence and so on and he said <laughs> so that's a great skill to have Baz I, I was in this pub and Thomas Campbell was in talking about burning these people out their house to get their ice cream you know well, they, 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 they mentioned this in there they're like is it like would you like because a couple of them got that like is a cop actually that says it was really good because he was the main kind of talking head for the cops who basically basically said in this more than once he's like that I mean yeah, we shouldn't have really been putting like when that case went to there, it was thin. Yeah, you know, it was like a really thin case here. You know, I didn't feel comfortable. I wouldn't have felt comfortable putting it there, but you know, ultimately got the conviction. So that's you know what's kind. But like he's like he's on that part as well, where he's like that. You know, like like the confessions that come in from things that are kind of overheard. This, if you were in a bar. Would you just be openly talking? Yeah. And they take it from two points. Would you be openly talking about having someone burned alive? But then there was the the kind of the, I think one of the journalists then said like that, or is that a case of I'm so powerful, yeah. so feared that I can talk about this in a pub, and who's going to say fucking anything about it? I'll circle back to that later on my personal experience, but 
the, <laughs> right. um, yeah, so that was uh, that fella eventually, like 10 years down the line, recanted all of that. Yes. And the original lawyers were focused very much on that, but he said he didn't say that now. Yeah. But that wasn't enough to get them out, and it wasn't until they brought in a new lawyer, that Amar Anwar, who I am not a big fan of. I have to say, I didn't really, I didn't, I, I, I'm not aware of him. Uh, he's not, he's not. See, if, you, if you lived in yeah. Glasgow for any time, you'd become familiar with Amar Anwar. He's all oh, right, right. He loves yeah. getting his face in the telly to be quite. Right. <laughs> but anyway, um, well, there's a there's a change in there's a change in the legislation in Scotland as well, where uh, it becomes but, evident that maybe the police had fabricated some shit yeah because what they actually pointed out was that the joe Steele's confession yeah was much wordier than thomas campbell's yeah they, they, he tries to recall and the word in it four cops <laughs> all gave word perfect matching statements but it's not a sentence that no no, that's any human is, would it, ever speak. It was a much longer <laughs> sentence. Than but like, the words aren't the even in the kind of yeah. thing. I yeah, told it was shoot the windows out, no to burn them or something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's, but it's the most protracted way to get to say yeah. like the the sentence is it's not even just wordy. It just doesn't feel like like we've just heard them talk as a talking head all the way through this, oh, and yeah. the words that are mentioned there are not the words that guy uses. Joe still talks Latin, or do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Say I fucking talk no. The, the way it's like the way he's trying the, the lawyers try to recall it is like I've tried, he's like even I and I've read yeah. this a million times I can't even like word for word and the way he's like I'm like that that's not the what that guy said yeah it's clearly so not what that guy that said was, that was how they got them yeah finally released was they had they you know they eventually kind of said about this kind of thing that was well this this cop this copper as well this copper this guy that was in charge of well, one of the senior investigators on that, and that is then found out on a different case did exactly the same thing. Yeah, where it's like I just had confession ha- to policemen yeah. in a moving vehicle by a guy who was uh, mentally disabled, I believe. Is yeah, yeah, that was the one that they kind of matched up. Yeah, they did. It was a guy from Johnson, actually, near from my sister lives. Um, yeah. was convicted of raping and murdering a girl in Woods, yeah. and the guy had a background and kind of low level sexual offences and stuff like that but he was educationally subnormal um yes and well they say he's investigated the- originally he does some sort of weird confession but the the guy that's in charge of the investigation is taken off and moved elsewhere is like that it's no him yeah yeah like, straight right. away it's no him this other guy gets moved in who has worked on the ice yeah, cream he wars has a investigation for closing cases as well yes yeah yeah as, as, you know you know what's really easy for closing cases, Baz? If you just make up the outcome. That's it, like, totally. You just got, totally. He said this. Like, I'm a copper. You know, taking a step back and looking at it, though, I mean, it wouldn't it be hard to believe that Thomas Campbell... Well, this is the thing that I was saying. Responsible yeah. for this thing, the overall. This thing is what I'm saying. Like, there's there's a part of me that they talk about there's um and they talk about it like a lot in like American cases more than they do necessarily UK based cases. Of, in fact, they were t- most recently the the. You, did you ever listen to the serial? Did you ever listen to serial? That no, first I never ever listened to it. No, I'm right, not the so one like, you're talking about though. Yeah, yeah, so it, it finally got resolved this year when the guy who'd been convicted was released, right? And he was released because there really isn't a case, right? Like, and that, that they actually, well, the weird thing about it is that podcast obviously laid out all the details and all the rest to the world, um, and it's, it's been kicking its way through appeal courts, but it eventually was being reviewed, um, and the district attorney and the DA and whatever wherever they are, Chicago, wherever it is, sat down and looked at it and was surprised at the lack of evidence. Like, just there isn't anything there. Like, there isn't anything there at all. No physical, like, like, like to an extent, no motive or anything like that. And so that was kind of... She basically they kicked it out. It was made free. They've got 30 days to raise the case again for the state. The state didn't raise it. He's free, right? But as, as kind of part of this... What's really interesting about the, the the podcast is the 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 podcast journalists interview different people, different police officers, but they interview uh, a guy who teaches 
and like goes in former cop goes around all the different precincts very mad very kind of uh uh, mind hunter, you know, it's like yeah, kind of yeah. goes around, and does all these things. But what he, he talks about good uh, interrogation practice, and what he basically says is there is no bad evidence, right? Ev- like there, there's no such thing as bad evidence, right? There's evidence that helps your case, and there's evidence that doesn't help your case. Yeah. And what you've got to do as the investigator is you've got to find the ev- evidence that proves the person you think committed the ki- crime committed the crime. That's not the same as looking at the evidence objectively and saying, "Who did this? Who did this?" Yeah, like that. That's that's what you do. That's how you build your case, and that's how ultimately, like, if you have got like a fucking hard on that is this person that did it, because he may have escaped a previous crime that you thought he did it, or he's done something. He's been on your radar. He's a trouble kid. He's the West Memphis Three. Mm-hmm. You got a fucking hard on for that. You can very quickly start to build a case on very circumstantial evidence from here, there, and everywhere, and here's the statements, and you can, if you put it in just the right way in front of people, you can tell a story that is believable to people that convict someone. Yeah. And this TC guy sounds like a real fucking scumbag. Yeah. Like a real scumbag. And if you're the cops, and you've seen this guy scut away in all these different things, and now it just so happens to be in the remit of that, I un- I can understand in that position where you could be like, I can get this guy off the streets. Yeah. But at the same time, not the risk of closing a case in a family that have like basically had like two generations obliterated overnight oh, by fire on a fucking gamble that you know one day could be removed in an appeals court, and that's yeah. where the sympathy for that sort of action just goes. I'm all for getting criminals off the street, but get them off the street for the right things. It's one fucking... of the one of the bits that I find really disturbing in it was. Again, I had I didn't know know this. So basically, only two people had died on the night. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. horrific. Child. Yeah. So the the two year old that we mentioned, yeah, and the mother who I mean the the mum was only in her early twenties, you know. Yeah. Um. But over the course of the next week to ten days, yeah, another four died, and there was somebody. I think it was a car, ex policeman saying. It apparently, if you inhale superheated air yeah. into your lungs, you can walk out fine. Yeah. But about two or three days later, you're dead. Because there, there's like photographs of a uh, Andrew Doyle, the, the, the guy yes. that were actually targeting the ice cream driver, walking out, like walking yeah. Right now, he's all blackened for the smoke and everything, you know, and they're trying to get like a blanket around him and everything. But they get that guy walked out that house, yeah. He's late, he was dead. Well, that's what they, they, they sp- specifically said. They thought, it, yeah, they thought the like family members were going to be they were like that. Well, it's yeah, tragedy, two people have died, but that like we've seen bad burdens and all yeah. the rest. These, yeah. you know, the rest of the family are going to survive, and it's this drip. Of two days later, one of them Another dies. Two days. days later, one of them dies, yeah. and it just is tragedy after tragedy sure. after tragedy. And like they, they talk about the the kind of grandmother of that family, and how she had to essentially like the because the, they they bury them all on the same day. Oh, and it's the and fucking horrific. Funeral, and there's horrific. Only five coffins. Yeah, they buried, they buried the, the baby with the mum. With the mother, it's oh, like just Jesus like stuff like you Christ hear those details, horrendous. and, and that's what I'm saying. You hear those, it. you hear those details, and then I think if I'm a police officer, yeah. and this fucking sc- I, that's what I'm saying. I, I, like, you have to, you have to be, you have to be that, you have to be legitimate though. Yeah, as much as you have to like, and it's so, it's so blatantly. I think that's the thing. Like the, the last thing I want to kind of touch on is the big thrust of this story, which is. Is Steel as a character who yeah. we've well, got TC uses somehow manages to get a camera in prison. Don't know how that happened, but he's doing these kind of video things of you know we will get freedom, we will get out and all the rest. So he does that kind of that kind of he grows his beard right out, you know, yeah. does the shave and all the rest. He basically he, went on a hunger strike when he went in. A jail. hunger strike would not eat unless his wife brought food into the prison, and they weren't allowed to bring food into yeah. the prison. So. And you've got Steel on the other hand, who becomes the fucking great Houdini. This guy escapes prisons in like a way which is fucking. One of the lawyers says he's like, you know, Thomas was great at 
in front of your camera talking and all that. Again. Yeah. So he says Joe Steele couldn't do that. Yeah. Joe Steele had other skills. <laughs> Joe Steele was really good at getting out of jail. Like fucking like oh, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> it gets like, my favourite one. Out. My favourite one is, is the like so it's not that like so the, the first time he gets to go home for a visit or something and he climb he manages to escape the police, climb on the roof of his mum's house That's and he has right. all the all the all the town now cheering him and all the rest. The second one is the greatest one ever. The second one, he not only escapes Baz, because they assume he's went back to his mum's roof, because yeah. uh, they give them, like, they let them out in a park and, like, monitor them all the rest. He escapes from there, travels down south, which he says is the first time he's ever been out the country. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Travels down south, a couple of stops on the way down, fish and chips and all the rest, but ends up Buckingham Palace, where he not only handcuffs himself to the railings, but he has seen people that have done that before, and they just come and cut the chains and then they take away. Super glues his hands to the railings. Yeah. Insane. Like, yeah. fucking, like, uh, like uh, absolutely mind-blowing. And then that's followed up by, so they, obviously they, they managed to get him there, yeah. take him back to jail. His brother's in to see him two days later, and his brother's getting interviewed for the documentary. He's like, so I just said to him, right, what are we doing next? <laughs> How are we getting out? He's like, 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 like that. We're, we're, pitch. we're going to do this. But that's it, like, literally says all that. He went to jail in less than a week. Yeah. Went to one of the islands off the west Arden, coast. Arden, I think. Is it, was it Arden, I think? No, no, it was one of the kind of remote ones. And, and um, then, yeah. Then came up with a scheme to break back into the jail. Yeah. And this is, I think this is why folk really started to take notice because this guy kept breaking out. Yeah. Kept, you know, he, he glued himself to Buckingham Palace railings. Yeah. You know what I mean? The first time he's up on top of the roof. So it's yes. just a matter of getting to him is difficult, yeah. but they got him. Yeah. He could have, he could have, he could have, they could have went on the lamb and he, he never He could have gone any time yeah. and never gone back. And then to actually try and break back into the prison. It's fucking amazing. You know, in the lot, right? Well, what is this? What is going on with this guy? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because he's... If, if he was just talking shit and what he do at the jail, he'd yeah. be long gone, you know? Yeah. So I know, yeah. he was a fascinating character, Joe Steele. He really, yeah. really was. Yeah, it's it's a really good it's a really good doc it's a tragic documentary because like we say oh, at the course, end and uh, Steele mentions that you end up in a position where the case is never going to be solved. No, and even no, no. even if they do get a name for it now, the likely suspect has been dead over a decade. Yeah, um, and the other one who maybe even gets mentioned at the end died almost a decade ago as well. So yeah. I mean, they're, they're never the family will never properly get justice and the. The, the people that were put behind serve time were acquitted and in this country you don't get compensation for that like he's yeah. not like Steele's not a millionaire oh god you know no. what I mean no no <laughs> so you don't get that you just go back to your like we're overturning it you go he, back to your life he's the so. same wee scheme that he lived in that, yeah your family you know yeah and that's that's kind of where you end up with it I think like just to bring it all into summation I think what the BBC have kind of cornered and I think what makes this great and you've touched on it more than once is the they managed to put you right there in the time yeah. very very quickly within five minutes you're in the Bible John yeah, yeah you're in 80s Glasgow you know the context you know the lay of the land you know how things work and they do it really well through a series of different talking heads of different classes and you know like different like like uh, different age ranges and all the rest, but and different authority statuses as well, and they do it like they get you there quick, yeah, and then they tell the story. The and I story think that's that. yeah, yep. I think that's like I I can't stress how important that is because especially if you're watching that out with you watching it even out with Glasgow, a lot of the, you need that. You need that. This is how this is how this all set up. This is how these things were allowed to happen, and this is the events that happened within it. And I think they really have that nailed, like yeah. a fine art. Um, and I think I think it's brilliant. I think that's them done two documentaries back to back that I think are just are just it's excellent. Just really, really, really well. Watchable. Yeah. Incredibly yes, definitely. Watchable. You don't need to be a true crime nut to enjoy these things. I mean, they are very accessible and as you say 
the, the picture they paint, it, it takes you into the story and, and yeah. it, it's like you can feel it kind of thing, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's very well done. brilliant to watch. Yeah, very, very, very well done. Um, so yeah, we'll wait and see where they go next. I, I, yeah, I don't know, there's pl- plenty of Scottish crimes. Okay. <laughs> Glasgow's hell, they're not killing each other. <laughs> I, I think the next BBC documentary is going to be based around the Jaws' shite Christmas night out that's already <laughs> elapsed by the time this episode drops. <laughs> that's um, that's can't true. wait for the talking heads on that one. Um, is, uh, yeah, just looking back to the previous episode. Then Baz started masturbating on everything. Um, <laughs> may happen. Um, I, once again, this I, it was a great <laughs> thing to do. I, I love doing these. Um, I we keep threatening that we'll we'll move away from Glasgow and Scotland and do and do something more worldly, and maybe we will in the next year. I, I like. I know we both have a a, a, a keen keenness for this sort of stuff yeah. anyway. So we'll see where it lands. Um, Baz, you will be on one more episode before the year is out. You'll oh, be on our Christmas yeah, Eve yeah. comment. Stop rolling your eyes. Oh. Anyway, you're going to be on the Christmas Eve commentary uh, so people will get to hear a couple of days after this drops you're going to be joyous it's going to be after the Christmas night out though so there'll be stories there's yeah. going to be <laughs> whether or not we can still speak <laughs> uh, but we're going to bring this in though uh, to, to a close right now uh, thank you very much for checking out this a little different episode of Bazzy's Backdoor Cinema. Once again, we're doing these in a different format. We're doing them in video format. So if you're on the YouTubes or you have subscribed to our YouTube page, you can check us out over there. The link will be on the website, so there'll be a little, you know, embedded iframe video that you can jump on and check out as well and see us there. If you're on any podcatching device that allows you to play video podcasts, so I know there are more than Spotify that allow you to do that. Spotify is the big one. Um, you will be able to see us there. Any other ones, you're still getting the audio pristine in your ears. But if you do have that curiosity, jump across and check out the, face, uh, the Facebook page uh, for links to our website and uh, and the YouTube as well. Um, Baz, this is a kind of done formal work for review episodes for the year. It's been a fucking incredible year. I've yeah, loved it's been it. A good year, man. We've covered a lot of territory. We've done a lot of movies. Um, we put two franchises to bed. We put their Texas Chainsaw Massacre one to bed. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And yeah, Halloween. and we put Halloween to bed. Uh, oh, and Phantasm. We did all Phantasm. Which oh, look at the Phantasm. face. Phantasm. Yeah, I'm so ha- so happy about that. Um, and we both agreed that Hellraiser's next, which I love that we have that <laughs> recorded. And you didn't say no there, so I love that that's now locked uh, in. I don't know if there's any point me saying no anymore. Don't 2023! 2023, the year of Pinhead. Um, Baz, for, for, for the last time before we, we do our Christmas episode and goodbye and all this, would you like to say goodbye to the listeners, please? Yeah, I hope you enjoyed the show, folks. Um, go and check out these documentaries or at least read up a little bit about the yeah. Ice Cream Wars. It was a very sad time in a city that had a lot of sadness in its history. Um, mm-hmm. I hope you enjoy us talking pish about it. And I will... Oh, I'm going to have to do this fucking commentary thing. But, but, but I will see you all in the new year when I'm actually talking about films I enjoy. I don't like your negative attitude. Um, <laughs> I don't like the films you pick for commentaries. I think we're going to have a good one this year. We'll discuss it on Saturday, but I think if I can get what I want and I can get us all on it, it's going to be fucking amazing um anyway let's live before we tease them any further ladies and gents thank you very much for checking out this episode of mazzy's backdoor cinema it will return in 2023 uh with more shenanigans more videos and more content than you can point a pointy stick at until then though wherever you are in this big bad world of ours please take care of yourselves out there this is duncan mcleish broadcasting live from under the stairs and i am signing off <laughs>